All right, guys, welcome back to the What Is Money show. I am honored today to be sitting down with one of the brightest and most respected minds in the world, I do believe. That is Mr. Balaji Srinivasan. Balaji, welcome. Well, thank you for having me, Robert. I like the show a lot. And, um, you know, I'm not sure if anybody's ever mentioned this to you, but you are actually the Chad meme brought to life. Uh, you know, and so you could basically just advertise the show yourself. So, uh, it, and, and the content is great as well. So, um, go ahead. I appreciate that. Um, I guess if we all need a meme, I'll take that one. It's a good uh, meme. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right, so, apology, you know, we've been setting up for this conversation for a while. Um, you and I have had a lot of really interesting exchanges about some really important ideas, I think, um, that are coming to the surface here increasingly in the 21st century. And the big one here is sovereignty. Sovereignty really seems to be changing um, rapidly in the digital age. It's something that we've long associated mostly with you know, the, the state or perhaps a monarch or some other um, ruler. Can we just start in the deep end of the pool? How do you define sovereignty? How do I define sovereignty? So I think of sovereignty as a continuum. And what I mean by that is um, what things can you do on your own without being vetoed by somebody else, without having permission, you know, from some outside entity or outside force. So, you know, for, for most people, they can move stuff around their room, right? They can move chairs around, but they can't go outside and uh, put up a street sign or take one down or edit most of the physical environment, even in their own house, you know, to put up a shed is actually something that's difficult to do in California, for example, without all these permits. You need a billion permits to go and build a shed. Right. But online, again, you're actually relatively sovereign over your domain name where you can read or write or edit that digital piece of land, which becomes more than a metaphor in VR, you can build because no one can prevent you from doing something. And if we're actually, if we go, you know, deeper on this, this kind of scales up from the individual, a group of people, um, can they edit their land? Can they create things um, without requiring approval from some outside force? Uh, for example, the Estonians, uh, pre-1991, could they have the Estonian language taught in school? Or did they need approval from the Soviet you know, colonizers basically who, you know, had put in Russians there as, you know, it wasn't necessarily the fault of the Russians who were moved in by, by Stalin and others, but those Russians were sort of used to crush the local Estonian culture. So the Estonians didn't have self-determination, they didn't have sovereignty in that sense. And then you can scale it up further, which is, okay, the Estonians can teach English in their schools because they have their own sovereign currency. Well, they had the Kroon for a long time, but they decided to then switch over to the Euro and join the EU. Mm -hmm. And that's actually also an important thing, which is um, sovereignty is sort of leavened by pragmatism. You know, you may decide to join a company and have a CEO as your boss, thereby limiting your sovereignty to some extent, or to join the military and have an admiral or a general who uh, can, can tell you to do something and you have to obey. But you would do so going in eyes wide open as saying, yes, I'm losing some sovereignty on that dimension, but on balance, I and maybe the world at large are gaining something from this. So I'm okay as a mature adult making that trade, right? So, you know, the when you think about it this way, and then you go up to the very highest level, which is, you know, can you invade any country around the world at will and move your ships everywhere and so on and so forth, which is what the U.S. was during its hyperpower era, which I think is now in the rearview mirror. And, you know, people are starting to, to realize that. Right. And, uh, you know, this is, of course, related to the libertarian concept of, you know, your right to swing your fist ends where, you know, someone else's face begins. Right. And if we 
go and analyze it. So, you know, as I mentioned, sovereignty is sort of constrained by pragmatism in that sense. It is not an unalloyed good because in the limit, total sovereignty becomes inability or refusal to cooperate with others. Hmm. Fundamentally, cooperation usually means entails some degree of self-sacrifice to achieve an outcome for the greater good. Now, I, I recognize that nowadays those words are used to get sacrifice from people without a greater good, <laughs> right, right? Right, right? So, so I recognize that that is abused. The language of collective participation, especially in the West, is abused to, to basically benefit an elite without benefiting the public at large using the language of public benefit. But that does not mean that it is not possible to have positive sum organizations where you give up some sovereignty in return for greater public benefit. So there's much more I can say, but let me, that's my kind of opening thoughts. That's a great, great intro. Thank you for that. So I would, maybe we could delineate a bit because it sounds like sovereignty has a lot to do with agency. Maybe they're almost, almost completely synonymous uh, it also sounds like the, the term optionality is loaded in there, like the actual freedom to do what you, do what you want. Um, and maybe the other dimension of freedom is there as well, the freedom from that. If you, if you have a certain degree of sovereignty, you can be free from uh, the opinions of others, perhaps. Um, but to your point, we need to occasionally abdicate some of our sovereignty as a means of expedience, perhaps, where, you, where we want to defer to a centralized institution uh, on some matters because it's more efficient to do so. Um, yeah, I mean, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, is is that, I guess the, la- the last question of this would be, from the libertarian point of view, are inviolable property rights and, and or free market capitalism in its purest sense, are these the correct methodologies for, uh, I don't know if allocating sovereignty is correct because it seems like sovereignty is actually bottom up. Um, but may, maybe the best way of dealing with the sovereignty of multiple actors simultaneously. Right. So the way I kind of think about this is, I would I would put myself in the you know Lee Kuan Yew school of political philosophy, which is to say. Um, depending on your current position in ideology space, uh, more libertarianism may be called for, or more collective behavior, or uh, more conservative behavior, or more liberal behavior, or what have you, right? It's kind of like with a car, when you're steering it, it doesn't just have a right turn or a left turn. It depends on your current position in space and where your goals are. And what what I think judges the outcome is sort of a meta concept of do people want to come to your jurisdiction or not? Are you on balance? Um, you know, are people leaving your jurisdiction or are they coming? And that shows in, in this huge vector space of all the policy parameters you could tweak from gun laws to abortion laws. Um, you know, tax rates, whatever, all of these parameters, this huge table, if you, if you actually enumerated them. And I believe there's multiple solutions. You know, the, um, you know one, one kind of thing that Indians actually talk about a fair bit is sort of dharmic versus, um, dharmic versus Abrahamic culture, where, you know, are there multiple solutions? Is it like polytheism where there's multiple gods and, you know, you do your God and I'll do mine? Or is it monotheistic where there is one state and one God? And, you know, this is this is like an internal human tension. Whenever you centralize, people will want to decentralize. So whenever you decentralize, people will want to reunify. Mm. You know, this is like China's concert, of the warring states period, followed by somebody rebuilding the empire, followed by putting it back together, right? right. Um, and, and breaking it apart. And so, uh, so to your point, I think that, you know, obviously, uh, the, you know, a lot of the theories of free market capitalism, very sympathetic to them. I think that we are, uh, in a sense, undercapitalized, you know, as a play on words today, mm-hmm. right, relative to what where, where we should be. But I also recognize that it's always possible to overcorrect on anything and um, that you you know there are certain things where a competent state like in singapore can allocate things that a short-term market mechanism either we haven't figured out the, the way of doing it 
or it, you know, it's not something where um, a short-term market mechanism is going to do crime and punishment in an easy way, for example, right? Mm. And so ultimately, I think of a lot of these things as sets of sliders or, 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 or levers or things you can flip, where the ultimate justification is actually at a very meta level, you can argue it's free market capitalism, because it's a free right of people to leave or enter that jurisdiction. Um, but not necessarily every individual transaction and action. It's like the more of the meta of entering versus exiting. Go ahead. No, that's very interesting. Um, so when you, you talked about individual sovereign jurisdictions actually competing for citizens, um, that itself seems to be an aspect of capitalism in a way kind of keeping them honest, right? If they if they are yes. overly oppressive or overbearing on their citizens, their citizens will move on to other jurisdictions. So they'll lose customers effectively, losing taxpayers. Um, does this mean then that we, so it seems like the free market would be the best, um, still struggling for a term here, the best system for um, maintaining the sovereign interests of the most people, but there are situations that you're alluding to here that the market cannot provide for. Are there, are, and I talked to Weinstein the other day about this. He was talking about situations of market failure. And this right. is a term, maybe I'm just over overweighted in libertarianism, but I don't know a lot about market failure. But that seems like a place where the state would be especially relevant or valuable. Are there certain circumstances that come to mind immediately where, where markets just aren't satisfactory and the state is preferred? Sure. So, for example, um, I'll give like three or four examples. One of them is um, actually an interesting, it's sort of a meta example. Are you familiar with the, of course you know Uber, but are you familiar with Sidecar? I'm not. So Sidecar was actually an Uber competitor. It was actually started, I believe, before Uber. And they had a feature in it where every driver could set their own price. Hmm. Okay, so it was further towards the independent contractor model. And uh, what happened was that was defeated in the market by Uber, which just centrally set a price based on its knowledge of buyers and sellers and what the market would bear. It had a broader context than those individual peer-to-peer -peer decisions. It's the opposite of the Hayekian argument that local context mm -hmm. will always produce the best decisions. This is global context in a database where this guy, you know, the, the server has a bird's eye view and can actually set a price that is more likely to be market clearing than the sort of rug merchant, you know, like, you know, like a rug merchant, you'll go and offer X and they'll come back with Y. That yeah. actually added so much time overhead that it meant that sidecar was not used as much as Uber. And so Uber was used. Okay. Right. So that's an example of what I would consider a pretty uh, you can argue that's a market failure. You can argue it's also not because, well, that market is contained within the larger market of picking Sidecar versus Uber, you know, in right, picking right. these two apps, right? And that gets back to the question of like free choice and citizens. But at least on a micro scale, I think that's one example, okay? Mm -hmm. um, another example is, you know, the concept of externalities. Um, you might have willing buyer and willing seller, but it might harm the public at large. You know, you, you have, uh, for example, there's a class example is pollution. You have a guy who's got a factory and a guy next door who's got a, a river. And maybe those two even can do a bilateral agreement to dump the pollutants in the river. But everybody downstream of that has a collective interest in, in not drinking that polluted water because mm -hmm. it's it's not simply on this guy's property. It's not fully sandboxed and enclosed. There's bleed over into other people. It gets back to the, you know, swinging your fist and hit somebody else's face, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the issue, of course, is that, you know, that's one thing when you talk about pollution, but, um, you know, in San Francisco, people will block neighboring developments because of shadows. Hmm. You set up a building and it causes shadows on the neighbor and that's an externality. <laughs> so they feel that they have an ability to go and stop you from building. And at first that seems ludicrous, but on the other hand, you can sort of be like, hey, you know, I had my little thing I could go and sun on, and that was very valuable to me. And that's actually why I bought this place. And now you've got this thing over here, which turned my sunny balcony into the oppressive 
uh, um, you know, whatever. I mean, the shadows of some gigantic condominium and it took away right. the spirit of the neighborhood. So you start to get into more gray and fuzzy areas when, when you start talking about externalities. But that, at least in pollution, that's like a cut and dried example. And then a third example is war. And this is one that I think goes extremely deep, which is if you have two societies, and this is actually something where I think, you know, as, as Bitcoin aficionados, we have to, we should think about, which is if, if you have two societies and uh, one of them can deficit spend and borrow from tomorrow to buy all of these guns today, and the other one can't, the first society might kill and outlive the second because it's able to just direct more force, mm -hmm. you yeah. know? And, and so the, the, the problem with that is it's a, it's like a, a beggar thy neighbor argument, you know, where um, it is a race to the bottom in a sense where the, the one that has, and, and one way of thinking about this, if you look at the U S government's debt to GDP ratio during world war II, it like spiked to this insane level. And it's kind of like, uh, you know, a bunch of boxers in the ring and, just to kind of use a metaphor, which one of them is going to take some, um, maybe, you know, some, hard, I think there's actually good steroids, potentially, there's, there's potentially drugs that could give you the benefits without the harm. But let's assume that there's only bad steroids, which one of them will take the bad story that'll let them knock the other guy out today, but they pay the price for it tomorrow. Mm, right. That's an issue where um, having long time preference, having a constrained state, it may actually not be able to break the rules and win today. And if you don't win today, there is no tomorrow. And right. thus the short time preference state knocks out and kills the long time preference one. Actually, you know, I've got a one-liner in this. You know what beats the non-aggression principle? What's that? The aggression principle. <laughs> okay. And what I mean by that is the non-aggression principle presumes you live in a civilized society in a sense. But if you're walking down the street and you practice a non-aggression principle and somebody who practices the aggression principle just sniper shoots you in the head, you don't even have the op opportunity to retaliate. Right. And uh, they can just go through your wallet, grab all your stuff, and then move on to the next guy, right? And then, you know, so then the question is, okay, well, what does that society look like that practices the aggression principle? Actually, in some ways, it looks like Twitter. It looks like like the woke culture where everybody's constantly stabbing each other. It's mm -hmm. like this, uh, you know, I, you don't seem like a Dungeons and Dragons guy, but you're con are you familiar with the concept of chaotic evil. Uh, I played Diablo two, which is kind of like the video game version of that sort of. Okay. I'm not okay. familiar so, with this concept. So, so it, basically if you were, if you were a huge nerd in the eighties or the nineties, Dungeons and Dragons has this concept of alignments and you could be like lawful good or chaotic good, you know? So like lawful good is a, a paladin or a cop that does everything by the book. Mm. Chaotic good is like the, the buddy cop who breaks all the rules, but has a heart of gold, you know, that kind of thing. Mm. Right. Yeah. So it's kind of like, like how law abiding, but do you have a heart of gold? Right? And Spirit so versus law, the letter of the law, maybe. Yeah, exactly. Right. So like, you know, lawful evil would be potentially in some ways, the Chinese communist party, which does operate under the law, but has built this sort of insane surveillance state and so on that erodes human freedom in many ways. And you can argue this because there's a lot of people in China will say it's good. And hey, it's actually restored sovereignty against the colonialist outsiders. And, you know, they're, they're the ones who got us out of, uh, you know, being occupied by the West and so on. Like the anti-colonialism there is a huge part of their moral justification domestically. Mm -hmm. Let's say that from the Western perspective, you'd say, okay, you know, many people would say CCP is like lawful evil versus chaotic evil is somebody who's just burning down your house in a riot. Mm. OK, they don't have any plan. There's no organization. That's just chaos and, and madness. Right. The non-aggression principle guys, they might be lawful good. The aggression principle is like chaotic evil. It's like a street gang that will just attack you and take your stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, the weakness of the strength of chaotic evil is because you abide by a code and they don't, they can just shoot you and take your stuff. And even if you have a gun and you do self-defense, you can't even retaliate. Like a calculated aggression principle that first strikes, unfortunately, is very effective, right? Right. Yes. Um, so the, uh, the thing is that there is an alternative which is um, 
in the presence of the aggression principle, I think what you land on is no internal first strike. And okay. no internal first strike means you don't have, I mean, living in a society which practices the aggression principle sucks because everybody's constantly stabbing each other. This mm-hmm. is the woke culture. This is a lot of Twitter communities where everybody's trying to gain status over somebody else. Mm-hmm. And, you know, whatever somebody did in the past doesn't matter. You're stabbing them today, you know, and, uh, and, and this is something where Twitter has wired people to do this, where the payoff that they see is not for loyalty. There's no loyalty points in the Twitter dashboard. It is how many likes and RTs and followers and engagement did you get today? It incentivizes me, me, me. It incentivizes betray. It incentivizes a lot of what I consider literally antisocial behavior on a social network mm-hmm. where um, it's it's essentially something that was entertaining when offline, you could just ignore all of that and go to Starbucks and you know or walk down the street and everybody's well behaved. But Twitter has become real life. Right. And you have those Twitter mobs in real life where these crazy people, because they get claps online, will go and punch you or surround your car or do, do crazy things, right? So the, the non-aggression principle is not really that uh, reasonable against people practicing the aggression principle. Instead, you need the tribalism of no internal first strike. And no internal first strike says, yeah, within our group, we are not going to first strike. We have a hierarchy and we have... Uh, you know, a way to do dispute resolution where if you have a problem with this other guy, you don't just punch him and take his stuff. You go to your superior and, you know, their superior and you find like the, the first common, you know, like, like ancestor, right? The, yeah. the person who's, is, you know, between both. And um, the no internal first strike uh, after some thought, that is the answer to the aggression principle because unlike the aggression principle, you're not living with a bunch of chaotic evil people. Mm. They aren't all going to stab you. You can go to sleep and wake up and know somebody hasn't shot you in the head. You can assume that there's going to be some loyalty and what you did for somebody yesterday. They're not going to try to stab you for status or whatever or money today. There is there's some degree of internal code. It's not just simply, you know, like a bunch of insects attacking each other or whatever, right? Yeah. Um, or, or animals attacking each other. Insects actually cooperate more. Uh-huh. Uh, however, no internal for strike does not rule out the possibility of being at war with a neighboring tribe that is known to practice the aggression principle. If that neighboring tribe is practicing the aggression principle, if it is known that the, you know, the, the green shirts will attack your orange shirts on site, then th- what is the rational strategy is for orange shirts to attack the green shirts on, st- on site, yeah. you know, killed before being killed. Right. And that is basically the logic of tribalism. And it is also, in a sense, to get back to your original point, it's also a market failure because every individual person uh, may not understand that that orange shirt wants to kill them or vice versa. Uh, They may not know who is an enemy. There is actually some degree of collective sharing of information, which is these are friends, these are foes. I mean, in a sense, you're rebuilding the concepts of border control, passports, um, you know, like a basic like like a coast guard or something like mm. that like like these defenses and you know on twitter that would be like shared block lists like blocknyt.com have you seen that yes i have yeah okay so yeah. that is a big piece of the future because twitter right now is a free fire zone it's it's just this digital war zone where um you know a lot of people think that they believe in an ideology on twitter what they <laughs> yeah. really actually believe in is twitterism you know why i say that no. Because there's no scoreboard for a team. Imagine you're playing a basketball game and all anybody saw were their own points, you know, their <laughs> own scores and so on. There's no team score. Nobody knew who was winning, who was losing. There's no incentive to pass, yeah. right? It was maybe you pass like one time for an alley for a dunk, but you're always the center of attention. Twitter actually stresses this sort of extreme level of individualism at uh, the expense, uh, like people will mouth an ideology, but it's mm. they're tricking themselves often and tricking others. I'm not saying everybody on Twitter is not genuine and, and so on. I am, however, saying that, uh, you know, the alternative would be, for example, uh, do, like, have you ever done enterprise sales? You, you actually may, may have done some of that. Yeah. I actually have not, but I've uh, had enterprise sales teams under me. Yeah. 
Okay, fine. I was so on the finance inter- side, but yes, I've, I've interacted with them a lot. Okay. So, so just like an NBA team where every individual has their own scores, but there's a collective score where it sums them together and it says whether they beat the other guys, uh, enterprise sales dashboards show every sales rep's individual sales, but also sums them together to determine what the sales of the company are, mm-hmm. right? Um, and you know, now that's actually a fairly sales is a pretty individualistic thing, even within large companies, but there's an aspect of teamwork as well, where, um, depending on how you're setting up, you know, if you're running a sales organization, the incentives matter a lot. You don't want to, um, you want to encourage some degree of cooperation rather than people stealing each other's leads and so on. So in addition to commission, you have an equity stake. So everybody's also all pulling for the company, but they've also got that individual term. And so this is the kind of thing I think about in terms of, you know, what are, how can, what market failures arise? How can you address them? You, you want an individual term for an individual's benefit, but you also want a collective term, which is the societal benefit, like the equity at plus the commission, the individual term. And, uh, and and that's probably also true for military situations, for any situation where if it's a group versus an individual, you kind of need to go to a group versus a group because otherwise you'll lose. Right. By wow. the way, you know what's funny is relative to you, I would probably sound much more collective. Relative to most other people, I sound <laughs> much more <laughs> libertarian, right? Um, and, and that's not just being a reflexive contrarian. That's I think it's just in terms of where people's premises are and what they tend to stress. And if they're dribbling with their right hand, then I, I wouldn't just dribble with my left just to be opposite. It's just right. that I think I, I try to at least be balanced in where the, the ultimate goal is not the ideology. It is a, a society which actually has people bloom and flourish and which they want to come to versus they want to flee from. Yes. And it makes a lot of sense. And I admittedly, as I tried to say earlier, I, I I do sense a bit of a blind spot in myself here related to market failures and or any benefits of, um, I guess you could say collectivism or statism more generally. Um, and that's something I'm, I'm trying to actively explore here. Hey, everybody. As you've no doubt learned by watching this show, Bitcoin is the single most important asset you can own in the 21st century. And one of the most important companies in Bitcoin today is Nidig. Nidig's mission is to get Bitcoin into the hands of as many people as possible. One of the ways they are accomplishing this mission is by empowering banks and financial technology companies to offer their own Bitcoin products and services. As a true game changer in the industry, Nidig is safely unlocking the power of Bitcoin for forward-thinking individuals and institutions alike. Led by Robbie Gutman, Yin Zhao, and Ross Stevens, Nidig has absolutely exploded onto the Bitcoin scene recently and has quickly become a leader in this space. So, whether you are a professional investor looking for asset management services or a company looking to white-label your own Bitcoin product or service, Consider Nidig your single source solution for everything Bitcoin. No internal first strike, non-aggression principle. Um, it all that this reminds me of, you know, Peterson. I'm a big Jordan Peterson fan, as you may or may not know. Mm-hmm. He describes this emergent morality among wolves, where they'll actually, if there's an alpha male dispute, they don't just kill each other. They have this, you know, kind of ritual practice where they do combat and then the loser will give up his neck to the winner. Uh, the alpha does not kill the loser. They just kind of go back to being a pack, knowing the pecking order, so to speak. Yep. And he, he makes a point that they, they do this because the wolf pack is more productive as a group than they would be if they were killing every t- killing one of the most important wolves every time there was a dispute. So it's right. sort of similar in markets where we all need the division of labor. That is literally what creates wealth and riches but we also need to compete with one another to keep each other honest. Yep. Um, so that that's really interesting. And then I guess that the this internal versus external first strike, where you want no internal first strike to preserve group cohesion, but you need to have external first strike, just game theoretically, right? You don't want to be yep. struck first necessarily. So this gets into that. I mean, the importance of groups, right? We have to form sort of in groups and out groups. 
for humans at least, and I guess people are organizing themselves under different canopies. Does this then get into very much the importance of defensive technology? Because we can never, at least with that outward group, you can never have a no first strike, which I guess would be the non-aggression principle more generally. You can't have that between groups necessarily because that creates this incentive for someone to strike first. This is like, the, yes. have you ever seen the Hawks versus Doves game matrix? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with it, but basically tell me what you're thinking hey, Basically about. a Hawk is a strategy that always escalates conflict. And a dove is ah, a strategy yes. that never escalates conflict. If you're in a room you full can't of doves, be either because you'll lose. You need a yeah. combination. Yeah, if you're a room full of doves, it pays to be a hawk, and vice versa, right. basically. Yep. Um, yep. But the more we can increase the cost to benefit ratio of violence or coercion, the more dovishness becomes kind of an optimal strategy, and that seems to be the general point of Bitcoin you know, and encryption. American Constitution, English common law, Bitcoin is a big one, clearly, that it just makes property less viable. Um, yep. This is, I, I'm just kind of spewing a lot of things out here, but this is something I think about a lot. I've been recording with this uh, libertarian philosopher that's espousing the, the ethics of Rothbard, who, which, where the non-aggression principle comes from, but I don't see how that ethic can ever be actually implemented absent these specific technologies or organizing systems. It's not enough to put it on paper. You actually have to, um, I guess, implement it via incentives, if that makes sense. Yes. So several things to kind of respond to a lot of, a lot I agree with actually. So one is, I also, I want to offer like a small clarification, which is when I say not, not that you didn't get this, but just to make sure I'm not misquoted. When I say no internal first strike, that actually doesn't mean that the group is always doing external first strikes just that it preserves the optionality to declare war right. on an other, another tribe such that first strike is okay, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, because if, if you completely limit yourself from that, then as you, as you mentioned, like Hawk versus Dove, it's a dominant strategy for the, for the bad guys to first strike you, right? Um, then, you know, the thing is that, you know, when you talk about market failures and collectivism versus statism, I think a useful way of reframing or thinking about this is the consent, uh, you know, that you had when you entered the collective and the trust you have in the collective. Because today, um, the language around market failures and so on is used and frequently abused by people who just want to coerce you, right? They use this language to justify state power, uh, the erosion of individual rights and, and whatnot. And fundamentally, they are disaligned with you. They, they basically have inherited the state without the nation. And what I mean by that is, you know, we use the word nation state, right? Or the phrase rather, but nation comes from like natality, you know, like common birth. Like the most classic example of a nation state would be uh, like Japan, you know, where it's, 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 a, it's an ethnic group um, or Israel. You know, this is this is something where it's a it's a group of people that have common culture and common descent and so on. And the state was emergently formed from hundreds or thousands of years of history from these people. And the state is like the collective expression of how they resolve disputes among themselves. But in the U.S., the U.S. really is no longer a nation in the sense that uh, you know, ethnicity usually or often is is thought to imply biology, but it's also like shared culture. The U.S. doesn't have one ethnic group anymore. For example, there's a lot of people who don't salute the flag, who don't like the flag. And so, you know, it's very hard to come up with a statement that every American will agree with. Uh, you know, I mentioned this sort of in a kind of joking way, but I think it's also true. An American would sooner burn the flag than burn a dollar. The dollar is like the last thing that pretty much you put a dollar on the ground and a flag and you're like, you know, which one of these you're going to burn. There's going to be some good chunk of people who would pick the flag over the dollar, right? Mm -hmm. uh, especially if it's a hundred dollar bill or so, and especially in 2021. And, uh, you know, so while it's sort of a flip comparison, the point is that the U.S. is really an economic union at best, like the EU. It's not really a nation state. It's not one nation under God. It is a bunch of different competing groups. And of course, you know, Republican, Democrat, or whatever is like the first principal component, but there's huge differences even within these groups that are sort of obscured by, you know, the current political polarization. 
And so in that kind of context, it's not that useful to talk about market failures because you have state failures and the state failure, if the state failure is happening, you can't redress a market failure with a failing state. Right. Right. Yeah, and and so, so your, your overall context is, I would argue, very correct for this moment that you can't address a market failure with a failing state. So your general, I, I, I think, skepticism of people who invoke market failure today in the US context is basically the right instinct. However, um, you know, what, one of my one-liners is, I am not in favor of crypto anarchy so much as crypto civilization. Mm -hmm. And crypto anarchy is superior to what exists in San Francisco, which is just anarchy or anarchy plus tyranny. Anarchy plus tyranny. Why is San Francisco anarchy plus tyranny? Because uh, you can have a, a lunatic stab somebody on the street or go and poop in the middle of the street, but an Uber driver who parks and is one minute over gets a $200 ticket. Right. So, yeah. right? so that working class guy, you know, that, that middle class person is... Uh, you know, can't can't build a shed, can't you know go one. There's no mercy for them. The state is completely ruthless towards them. It's tyrannical towards them. But um, there, there's simultaneously anarchy for the clients of the state that can literally smash, grab, stab, you know, in public. So relative to that, crypto anarchy is better, where the state itself goes away because it is because of the state that you have this homeless crisis in SF. It is, you know, the budget has gone through the roof for this homeless industrial complex. At the same time, the homeless themselves have increased. These guys are paid de facto to continue and to exacerbate the problem rather than to solve it. Right. Hence things like, you know, the needle giveaways and, uh, you know, the stuff that, that like basically um, repeals the sit and stand bans, which you saw in Texas, you know, they're, they're essentially causing the problem that they then present themselves as a solution to, and they get these grants for it. So in that context, yes, crypto anarchy is better than that, where you just take the state away entirely and you go on peer to peer. But then the next step after that is crypto civilization. And if you know that Bitcoin is going to win, if you know that if, if you and I, we take Bitcoin seriously, we take, I think, crypto and crypto as a space more broadly than just Bitcoin seriously, and we could you know, talk about that if you want, um, then what comes after that? And crypto anarchy, I don't think can be our goal in maybe a transitional phase, mm -hmm. but we want to figure out what crypto civilization looks like. And that means realizing that, yes, market failures do exist, but we want to have a, a new state that can address that versus appealing to an existing and failed state. Maybe that was... Digressive, no, but hopefully absolutely. And I agree. And let me so agree that San Francisco, the two items you laid out, in my mind, those are externalities of statism, right? The guy getting the two hundred dollar ticket such that he can't even be an effective entrepreneur. It's very impeding to his uh, creation of value in the market economy. But then also, the state is sort of creating the homeless supply homeless problem. And I, I don't know that it's, you'd pin that on San Francisco per se. I would put that more on like the fed. I think the actual, the printing of money is creating, um, I, we know, first of all, government intervention in the labor market is creating unemployment. You know, that inflation is disproportionately victimizing the poor. So you could only, I guess, conjecture that it would be directly contributing to homelessness. It's, well, it's one of these things where basically the word, so there's a great um, one hour documentary called Seattle is Dying by Como News. Mm. I think it's an ABC affiliate. It's got millions of views. And one point they make is that even the term homeless is actually an incorrect term because the vast majority of these folks are drug addicted and or mentally ill in the clinical mm. sense, like diagnosed with a mental illness. Right. Because most people who have some economic problem, who I'm sympathetic to, and frankly, I'm even sympathetic in a sense to the drug addicts, so long as they're not, you know, attacking you on the street, right? Mm. Um, the, uh, the people who just have economic issues with living in the city tend to just move out of the city and move to a much cheaper locale. Right. Uh, and yes, that's that's a huge part of the Fed boosting housing prices and so on. But the homeless problem is not a housing problem. It's an opioid problem. It's a drug and mental illness problem. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, this is something where like... Uh, a tricky thing for some, not all, but some libertarians to think about is that uh, 
you know, some people can handle drugs and some people cannot. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, we actually sort of understand this with alcohol. You know, there's some people who can hold their liquor and other people who really shouldn't drink very much because, you know, either literally biologically, they, they get red cheeks or, you know, they're, they're, they, they, uh, they don't have the right alcohol dehydrogenase enzymes or what have you, uh, or, um, they get fairly violent or crazy. People have varying responses. That's called pharmacogenetics. You know, there, there is a varying response to a drug like alcohol, a drug like heroin. So some people can handle drugs and some people can't, and some people can handle them in moderation and some people get addicted and they break through moderation. And so the one size fits all, the very ideological policy may not make sense where the libertarian is thinking, oh, well, I don't want harsh drugs laws because I can handle it. But obviously, there's a bunch of people on the streets who cannot. Right. And so, you know, often, in fact, those people may want like a dry area or the equivalent of a drug free area where society is sort of helping them maintain their willpower. You know, right. in, in the same way that people will sometimes you'll get a buddy to be like, hey, dude, you know, want to help me go and work out. I'm just feeling lazy today. Right. The extension of that to the societal level is where the society is providing the public good to bolster that fallible human being who might, you know, do drugs when they don't want to do them. Right. Instead, what the state is doing in San Francisco, it's like, here's free needles. Hey, go and shoot up on, you know, the side of the bus. It's like Maybe. the actual opposite. The collective is like pushing people into addiction and desperation. And the FDA has legalized opioids and let them through while blocking other good things. There's many different axes on which the state contributes to this. I completely agree with the one you mentioned with the Fed printing money and propping up housing prices, but that's only one of the drivers here. Right. No, agreed completely. And uh, on that website, WTFHappen1971.com, I'm pretty sure they showed opiate addiction exploding after 1971. So I've often wondered about the, the connection there. Um, so you made this point that, United States is pretty much an economic union, right? It's not at so best, much right now. Yeah, yeah at best, <laughs> right. uh, one that seems to be dissolving kind of quickly. So, is it that maybe fiat currency or central banking more generally, it actually has caused the nation state to swell beyond its natural size in a way? We have too many natalities under one state, uh, to put it in, ter- in a term you used earlier. Yep. Is that then, but that is that itself is divorced from the market. So that is a distinctive state failure, I would say central banking yeah. as a whole. And is that then, you, you know, you mentioned earlier that some people can handle alcohol, some people can't. It seems like no human civilization can handle fiat very long. It is the drug that really <laughs> does destroy us. Um, so it's, it's, Go ahead. Finish. Yeah, I was just going to say, is that the problem that this we, we, we've bloated bureaucracy to where we have several thousand natalities under one state when when in a more free market paradigm, it would be much more like decentralized, smaller nation states? So the way I think about it is. All ideologies have existed pretty much for thousands of years. Like you go back to Plato and Aristotle and you can read their disquisitions, some of which are very contemporaneously relevant. It's actually amazing that in a time without the internet or you know, without that many people being literate or before the printing press, that they could get the, the level of abstraction and scope mm. to be able to generalize about human polities. It's actually insane that they were able to do it. My point is that um, you know, if you think of technology as the driving force of history, uh, yes, today I do think that we're going to see a great decentralization. I think, but I think the future is a decentralized West and a centralized East, mm. because China and then also India were basically refounded in 1978 and 1991, respectively, and they have been able to ride the tiger of the internet upward and channel the you know decentralizing aspects through a centralized kind of thing. Um, China, in, in an obvious way, India is not that much on people's radar. Like one way of thinking about it is, how much was China on people's radars in 2010 in the U.S.? Not really that much. I mean, yeah, you might trade with China. People kind of knew about it. Guys in the Midwest would complain with some justification about their jobs being shipped there or whatever. Uh, but it wasn't like you know number one issue, or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. It became a much bigger deal. China was obviously a big deal by the middle of the decade. And now there's a bipartisan consensus on 2020 after the thing has already gotten really big, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) And 
I think India is actually that for the 2020s. And by 2030, it'll be clear that it's like the US, India, and China, or what succeeds the US, the decentralized states of America, the decentralized states of Europe, India, and China. Should well, I talk about that for a second? That's a scenario. I, I would love to hear about that. And if you could talk about potential conflict between the two, because this gets back to the centralized state having an advantage potentially uh, over the over a decentralized state. Yeah. So, okay. So first, let me sketch a high level scenario. This is just a scenario. It's like the kind of thing that you might write up as a fictional thing to test your understanding and so on. So I'm not assigning extremely high probability to it. No, do I assign zero? I think it was a scenario. Okay. What's the scenario? The scenario is um, the US military either uh, is literally defeated in battle by the Chinese military mm -hmm. over Taiwan, or it does not even contest it. It just stays back like it did with Hong Kong or in the retreat from Afghanistan or Crimea or other places. It just decides as a country that, hey, that's not worth the fight. You know, we don't really care about Taiwan. We're war wary. We've got other things at home. Okay. If that happens, that's an epochal moment where clearly the hyperpower era is formally over. That is, uh, that's the Suez moment for the USA. What I mean by that is the true moment where Britain knew it was no longer a superpower was not really the end of World War II because it was still formally in the winner's circle. It was the Suez crisis of, I believe, like 1956 or thereabouts, 1950s, where Britain tried to intervene with um, you know, a Suez Canal related issue. And um, I think France did as well. And the US stepped in and said, actually, it's not going to be that way. We're, you're going to do it the way the Americans do. And Britain was like, whoa, I'm not sovereign anymore. I can get vetoed by this thing above me. I'm no longer the British Empire. right? And they'd sort of been in denial about it. They'd actually lost their colonies and they'd lost India, even though they won World War II. And, but, but people were sort of in denial about this. But that was when it was truly obvious that it was no longer number one, uncontested. Mm -hmm. So a Chinese victory is not the victory over Taiwan, per se. It is like China's number one, or at least the U.S. no longer is. You know, even if China is just a regional uh, hegemon, the U.S. has has lost. Mm -hmm. And the psychological impact of that will probably mean something like um, Japan rearms and may even ask the Americans to leave, because if they're an unreliable ally, they're not an ally. You know, why are you even here, right? Uh, Germany and others, basically everybody rearms, and they realize that the U.S. is. Um, it's gone from just like the USSR became Russia, the USA becomes America. Right. It's gone from a global ideological empire to just a country. And it's no longer trying to export democracy around the world. And, and the American model is no longer a model for the world because it is polarized, because there's left and right fighting each other in the streets, because maybe inflation has hit in a, in a big way, right. because, you know, people are, are fighting like children on the internet, like, you know, politicians are yelling and cursing at each other, because it's basically degenerated into something that's no longer a model for the world, uh, right. people stop following it. And in that event, I mean, one of the things that I'm tracking now, again, this is a scenario, but uh, there's an increasing level of city and state independence and what I'm sort of bullish on is what I call subnational and international. Subnational meaning uh, cities like Miami, states like Wyoming and Colorado and Texas um, that are doing Bitcoin and crypto things like Wyoming's Dow Law or Miami with Miami Coin or Colorado accepting Bitcoin for taxes and, and so on and so forth. These are things where at the state level, you're seeing pro-Bitcoin, pro-crypto legislation. But... Uh, you're also seeing this as part of a broader trend, which is, you know, with sanctuary cities, cities have been setting their own immigration policy, cities have been setting their own, and states have been setting their own drug policy on marijuana laws, you can look at the map on that, uh, on gun laws, open carry has, has changed a great deal over the last, you know, 10, 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. And then on abortion law, you know, again, without taking a position on these issues, the fact that the Supreme Court basically declined to hear it, you know, the, the Texas abortion law, uh, th that was actually a real symptom of decentralization in many respects, because the, the way that um, the anti-abortion and pro-abortion or pro-choice, pro whatever, uh, folks are going to kind of retaliate is some um, blue states are going to go like extremely anti-gun and say, you know, you get the, similar to the Texas thing, it's $10,000 for anybody who's violating a gun law. 
right? And they decentralize the enforcement. And so instead of a federal entity that is doing dispute resolution between states and having a middle of the road thing, you get a tit for tat where states are differentiating. And as I said, the dollar is the one thing holding this tattered union together. And when that goes, the whole thing goes. And what are the pieces that would lead to that? Well, Bitcoin is clearly one piece, but I actually think Miami coin is also another important piece of this because it means cities and states will issue their own fiat currencies. Right. Right. And now to your point earlier, is fiat the root of all evil? Um, Certainly today, I think you can argue it is because of the way it's being used, it's being used without a check. That's right. It is the, right? the, uh, the irredeemability, forced irredeemability is the main problem. Yes, that's right. But another way of thinking about it is if you look at the, you know, the famous graph of the loss of the dollar's purchasing power, which actually surprisingly FRED, you know, the 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 economic data set that the Federal Reserve maintains, right? Mm-hmm. FRED actually has that graph, which you probably pasted a, a bunch of times, right? And there's also the Bitcoin graph, which shows over the last 10 years, Bitcoin's price has just soared, right? But if we zoom out, and again, you know that I've I've been one of the very earliest advocates of Bitcoin and taking risks to make the thing legal and all the stuff. I mean, uh, j- just just to put my bona fides on the table here, because a lot of people you know may not know this. I'm thank you for that, I'm, by the way. Thank you for your leadership in Bitcoin. Honestly, well, I I, I appreciate that. It sounds something I, I thumped my chest on, but just you know, for example, some things like in 2013, I taught a, a MOOC course with 250,000 students where the students got BTC, and some of those folks went on to do parts of Bitcoin.org. Like Will Bins came out of that class to do that. A lot of people got Bitcoin at 10 bucks or something, you know, out of that. Um, you know, we we set up Coin Center, like me and Alex Morcos, who's a core Bitcoin dev, and Jerry Brito. Uh, and Jerry Brito testified in 2013 at the Senate hearings, then where people thought Bitcoin was going to be maybe deemed illegal. Um, you know, I've, I've brought literally billions of dollars of fiat currency, probably tens of billions via various vehicles into Bitcoin through both the MOOC and through like Earn, which got acquired by Coinbase, on there of a million people directly. I've gotten like their first 10 bucks of BTC and whatever, all these articles, you know, why India should buy Bitcoins. So I just want to put that on the table. As yeah, I would just, just for me personally, for you, just the vision that you have brought to the space. And I think that's influenced a lot of other visionaries that have sort of built on each other. So that's what, I know you've done a lot pragmatically, but this is someone that operates on kind of the future looking side of things. You've been very uh, inspirational in that respect. Th- thank you. I appreciate that. And I think you've done a phenomenal job on your podcast. Well, I know it's, you know, a lot of people like it thank and you. Uh, you know, I listen to it. Um, and so the reason I just put that out there is, uh, Relative to most people, I'm a, I'm a Bitcoin maxi, 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 maximalist, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, because uh, I, I don't believe other cryptocurrencies actually really compete with Bitcoin in the sense of, I do think they should exist. I think that we need private coins. I need think we need smart contracts. I think we need digital corporations and digital m and I think we need automated accounting. I think we need those things. That's a whole discussion or whatever. But um, the reason I say this is because of necessary corrective to the post-1971, or really maybe the 20th century, or arguably the last whatever 100 years, you know, I was actually, uh, you know, uh, I nuked a bunch of the older tweets pre-2017, but I was one of the uh, people who was tweeting a lot about the sovereign individual in 2014 mm. and, and 2015 and so on. And I think getting a lot of copies of that and getting the Kindle version of that and getting that out there, and sovereign individual makes this thesis uh, you know, in a lot more detail about, you know, the history of violence and mm-hmm. how centralization has uh, has caused fiat and the expropriation of money. Okay. So let's put all that on the table. Let's stipulate all that. Okay. The other day, I posted a couple of charts that helped me think about fiat in a different light. And um, those charts were basically showing the long-term reduction in purchasing power, uh, thanks to fiat. Okay. And uh, the short-term rise of Bitcoin, like basically over 100 years and 10 years, these charts respectively. And here was the key observation. You know, you know the term like um, you know express preference versus actual preference. Uh, yeah, what you say you want versus what you actually want, and you may not exactly. actually you may not actually know your actual preference. I think as well. <laughs> Correct. That's right. So an important question is, in the presence of Bitcoin. Why have people not gone all in on Bitcoin completely? Okay, I do believe it should exist. I do believe it's superior in many respects. But 
there's something there where clearly there's a, a, an actual preference of people keeping at least some in fiat, some people keeping at least some in fiat. Why is that? Right. Well, one argument is around adoption. You know, lots of people have it because governments force people to accept it. Uh, another argument is, um, you know, about uh, short term volatility. And this is where things get interesting, which is I think there's an opportunity to, um, you know, Chesterton's fence. I don't. It's a, it's a concept that sometimes there's a fence that exists. And people give explanations as to why it exists that are actually bad. I do, I do know but, this now. This is the quote from G.K. Chesterton, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Strong like, fences like, make good neighbors, something like that. Oh well, well, well. So that that's that's related, but that's distinct. Chesterton's okay. fence essentially says, if there's a fence and you can't tell me why it's there, you shouldn't tear it down. It's only if you can tell me why it's there that you can tear it down. Interesting, right? And and often there's a kind of variant of this, which is there's a fence. And it's there, but the reason it's there is not the reason people say it's there. For example, like various religious prohibitions on eating meat or, you know, like, like in the Middle East, you know, uh, yes, with, yes. with uh, Judaism, right? Those are probably because um, they prevented people from getting trichinosis or various, you know, illnesses, but they explained it as if it was this religious thing where God mm. would strike you down. And, but it was adaptive. They did it without understanding why they were doing it, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's a possible understanding of fiat, which is this. Fiat provides short-term price stability at the expense of long-term depreciation. And Bitcoin makes the opposite trade-off. It has no short-term price stability, mm -hmm. but it has long-term appreciation. Yes. And that okay. makes sense. Elasticity makes sense. gives you that benefit. Yes. Right. And so if you think about Greenspan and the plunge protection team and so on, there's a lot of stupid uses of fiat. Mm. But the smart use would basically be something like, hey, a lot of people want a short-term stable instrument. And when you get into the mechanics of how you would maintain a short-term stable instrument, it means that this instrument, okay, let's call it fiat as opposed to USD, okay? Mm -hmm. It has order books against N different things. There's an order book for milk and for meat and bread and whatever. Okay, don't eat bread because bread is bad for you. You know what I mean? Some <laughs> some keto bread. Okay, yeah, yeah. right. So, so you've got order books for these for these different things, and you've got fiat versus milk, fiat versus meat. Limit orders placed. Okay, I'll buy five units of um, milk for one unit of fiat or whatever. Right. It's literally like an order book, just like you know BTC USD or whatever. Okay, mm -hmm. but you've got n of them in different order books here. And maintaining what I call not a stable coin, but a flat coin, okay, a price stability, okay, means you're maintaining the price at the middle of those order books by placing limit orders on both sides so that if it's starting to shift too much in one direction or another, you stop it from getting out of sight. Now, right. the, the thing about this is there might be a genuine shortage. It might be something where, like, you know, batteries just aren't even brought into your country anymore. And so that's going to cause like the price of one of those end goods to just soar and you just kind of let that go. Yeah. Okay. Right. It's this is this is related to the mathematical concept of constrained optimization, yep. where you have a budget to place these limit orders and to keep the price in a range, but you're not crazy about it. And you don't blow the entire budget on something where there's a true shortage and it's just you know, getting out of sight, you just spend it on, at least let's keep it in range for milk and meat and bread and these other things. Right. Okay. So it's like an intelligent allocation of resources to stabilize this, this currency against these things. Okay. And just to, re to restate that. So it's, uh, when you say price stability, I think what we're saying is persistent purchasing power of this digital fiat or whatever we're calling it, uh, that's being maintained by like algorithmic options. It sounds like. Yeah. So, so you know, the concept of an order book, have you seen like, a, I'm sure you've yes. seen it, but basically yes. it, it is the something where chart. the depth chart, exactly. Yes. That's right. The reason the order book, by the way, it's actually a very sophisticated thing that took me a long time to wrap my head around is, um, you know, most people offline, like your retail customer is a price taker. When you go to the store, you're just buying one can of orange juice or whatever, and that's like five bucks or or whatever it is. Maybe it's 20 bucks in, in inflation in America now, but okay, like five, five bucks, right? And you are not uh you are not affecting the price with that one buy order. Right. But if you went and you bought all the units in that store 
and you cleared them out, you bought, okay, I'm going to take a thousand for five bucks each. Then you go over to the next door and they've got a different price. Okay, I'm going to take these units and I'm going to get 2000, but it's going to be 550. And the next door, right? Now you start going from retail where you're a price taker to wholesale where you are at least a price effector, if not a price setter. Okay. Right. And then true wholesale is you don't go to the store, you actually place it online in like some commodities exchange, right? Mm-hmm. Like Chicago Mercantile Exchange or something like that. And it yeah. might be orange futures as opposed to actual cans of orange juice, but it's it's conceptually similar. Yeah? yeah. And the thing about this is one of the things that's happened over the last 10 years that I think is very underappreciated is tens of millions of people have learned how prices are born. Mm-hmm. Right, because they've actually seen the raw supply and demand. Right, they they understand how a commodity business, at least, is truly at the whim of the market. Are you saying and this does not have to, thanks to crypto? People have figured this out. Yes, exactly, because yeah. they've seen order books yeah. in front of their faces. They're seeing what supply and demand really is. It's not an abstraction. Mm-hmm. It's literally price, comma quantity pairs, and all the algorithms and stuff you can run on that. And you realize, whoa, the market really is this massively multiplayer game. Mm -hmm. It's not somebody necessarily rigging the price at the store, this all-powerful thing. It's this thing where often the CEO of that company is just as subject to the market price as you are. That's right. Yeah, Yeah, I loved your your tweet, I think, maybe a week or two ago. The boss of the CEO is the market, if I'm saying that. Yeah, exactly. Everybody's boss is the CEO other than the CEO. The CEO's boss is the market, right? Now- Of course, there's some CEOs who have enough concentrated power that they can move markets. That is true. You can set a new equilibrium. Um, You know, an iPhone, for example, like they're differentiated enough that they're not in the same order book in a sense. They can like create their own order book and set their own price. But that, by the way, is like when people talk about what a commodity business is, I would argue that the, the most precise definition of a commodity business in 2021 is, does it have an order book? Right. If it does, it's a commodity business because it's fungible and because we can now set up order books for everything thanks to crypto. Yeah. Um, if it does not, then you can sell it as one of a kind. It's an iPhone and you can set it at $4.99 because Apple is a monopoly seller. They're the only people placing sell orders in that quote order book. They're, they control it, right? It's just like literally one spike and you take it or leave it. It's not like a whole array of people selling at different prices, right? right? You can you realize that prices are, are just a tug of war process. You know, between the buyers and the sellers, it's a constant yeah. tug of war. Who's tugging more? And it can yank up at this time and, and yank down at this time, right? And and yet, once you, that's like what it actually is. But if you're just on the outside and you want some orange juice, you don't want to be in this tug of war competition necessarily for everything all the time. You don't necessarily want all of that volatility. What you might want is a central actor that stabilizes by kind of, you know, reducing Mm -hmm. the degree to which people can tug this side or that side. And to be clear, I'm saying you're opting into this. I'm not saying it's being forced on you. I'm arguing it's different than the current fiat. But I am saying that a, a instrument that maintains price stability in the short run, one way of doing that, see, to, to place these limit orders to maintain the price across milk yes. and meat and so on. You, you need a budget. Where does a budget come from? Maybe it comes from inflation. Right. And now we come back around. So you have Bitcoin, which is the check on the system. It is the, the ripcord, the parachute, the exit. It is the discipline for everything. Yes. If it misbehaves, people exit to BTC. Okay. And when that exists and when that disciplines, now you can have a smart fiat, not by the US, which is not capable of doing that, but maybe by an American state or by a Switzerland or a Dubai or a Singapore, which is an intelligent financial capital, like the Swiss franc, the CHF, is used to competing in a global market, right? And mm-hmm. right now, all of the stuff about CBDCs is um, basically the Orwellian Chinese version or the woke version where it's like negative interest rates and it'll freeze your funds and so on and so forth. But it's possible that some of the smaller countries realize they're in a global currency competition and decide to add different features to their CBDCs, like Mm -hmm. privacy, Mm -hmm. right? Like user custody, like programmability, like short-term stability at the expense of specified long-term depreciation. Right. Okay. And uh, and I think that is what's going to happen. We're about to enter the era of global monetary competition. 